All right. All right, you kids, settle down. Uh, my name is James Trestwich. This is Remedial Blockchain 202. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of ground very quickly, so if you need to, come see me after class. I'll be having office hours, uh, and there will be a test next week. All right. So uh, my name's James. I worked on a few companies in the space. My current gig is co-founder at Suma. Suma is an interoperability cross-chain communications company. Uh, we work on all of this like cross-chain stuff. Lately, a lot of people have been calling me like that atomic swaps guy, which I really hate because atomic swaps kind of suck. Um, they're slow and they taste bad. The exception being layer two swaps, like Ethan up there somewhere works on, uh, which are much better than layer one swaps. But nobody even knows what those are, so like, let's move on. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Ethan. Sorry, Sharon. Okay, so this is the standard tier Nolan atomic swap, which was invented in like 2014. Uh, prob has anyone in this room actually done an atomic swap? Can you, can you raise your hand? So the people who work on it specifically and like three other people. <laughs> yeah, great, uh, I have. Um, they're really terrible, but this is the best case scenario. First, I escrow money, we wait for a confirmation cycle, you escrow money, and then we both swap after another confirmation cycle. So best case is this takes two confirmation cycles. And uh, I'm gonna use that term a lot during this talk. A confirmation cycle is how long it takes to get confidence on a blockchain. Proof of work is all probabilistic. In Bitcoin, we say it's about six blocks. In Verge or Vertcoin or something like that, we say it's six months. Uh, <laughs> it varies pretty widely. Um, so. First, we have the negotiation step. We agree what we're going to do, and then we actually go and do this, and it takes two confirmation cycles on chain. Uh, well, on two chains. Uh, okay, so two confirmation cycles for each participant, right? So this is the most likely scenario from the tier Nolan atomic swap, is we go through negotiation, and then nothing happens, because why would I do that? Um, there's no like binding connection between negotiation and the actual swap itself unless you're on layer two, like Ethan and Sharon over there. Um, okay, so the easy scenario is that we negotiate, we go through this like communication process and then none of us gets anything out of it. The next most likely scenario is that we go through the negotiation, I put up my funds and then you bail, right? You just never fund again and I have to wait multiple confirmation cycles, like six or seven or more, to get my money back. Uh, this costs you nothing to do, and it costs me a lot of time and liquidity. And spending liquidity is expensive. Okay, so then the next most likely scenario after that, I fund, you fund, and then I refuse to settle as long as possible. This is called the free option. The trade happens at my discretion once we've both funded, and that means I might just wait to see what the price of Bitcoin and Ether do over time to see if I want to exercise that trade. I can just let it expire. It takes a bunch of time, but uh, like, that's fine for me. I'm getting value out of this. All right, and so this is the bad case. The bad case is, uh, well, confirmation cycles are a little like wibbly, wobbly, timey, wimey kind of stuff. Um, if we're on Verge or Vertcoin, or I'm a miner with a lot of hash rate, I can actually make chains go faster. And because the tier null and atomic swap relies on ordering across two chains for its security, if I can make time go faster, I can break it, and I can just steal your money. Uh, if I can refund my funds before I take yours, I can just take your money. Okay, so we can do better than this. We can do better than the tier null and atomic swap with blockchain. Blockchain. Okay, so this is a blockchain as envisaged by its creator, Satoshi Nakamoto. He got this thing where time goes backwards in all of his diagrams, and all of these arrows are pointing wrong, uh, so just ignore that part. But like, this is basically a blockchain, right? Uh, each block includes the hash of the previous block, and the hash of some transactions, and time moves forward at a fairly steady, wibbly-wobbly pace. Okay, and so a chain makes the history, and the history determines the state. The history is all the transactions that have happened, and by playing those, we can determine who has money and who doesn't. 
The state is everybody's coins that haven't been spent yet. Okay, so when we're building consensus, we follow the heaviest valid chain, which means that generally we're gonna go from like the left there to the right, and we're gonna follow the chain with the most blocks most of the time, but not always. Usually most blocks means heaviest, but there are weird edge cases. So you can see this chain, it starts over here on the left, and then it goes down this way, and then it goes off the right side of the screen. So we follow the heaviest valid chain. And so if that block off to the bottom there is invalid because it says the earth is flat or something stupid like that, we ignore it. It's not a valid block and we follow the other chain. And uh, following the heaviest valid chain resolves conflicts. If Alice tries to double spend her money, we follow the chain that's heaviest and we say it's invalid if she double spends. So Alice can't double spend because it would either be invalid to double spend or we're in a history where she only spent it once. So in this case, Bob gets the money and not Charlie. Okay, so what if I don't want other people's transactions because those are growing at like a megabyte every 10 minutes and I only have a really small computer? Well, we have this thing called SPV, which as everybody knows stands for special purpose, oh, wait, sorry, wrong, wrong talk. Uh, simple payment verification, or some variation of that, right? So in this, we're going to check the weight of the blocks, but we don't actually sync the transactions. So we end up with an 80-byte header for every block, but we don't see any transactions. We ask specifically for transactions we care about if we want them. Okay. So weight still resolves conflicts. You can still get a transaction and check that it's in the heaviest chain, but we don't prove validity. We're not checking every transaction, so we don't know if somewhere in our history there's an invalid transaction. But like, that's probably okay, because everybody does this all the time anyway, and uh, raise your hand if you're running a full node at home. I am like, okay, we got a good crowd. So uh, it looks like about 10% of the room validates the entire blockchain, and everyone else is using SPV or worse. Um, most users, are relying on something that is strictly worse than this, blockchain.info. All right. <laughs> so the trade-off with SPV is that we assume miners are enforcing validity. We assume that the majority of the hash rate will not follow a bad chain. We don't know that, we assume it. We can't check it, we assume it. All right, so for SPV, we keep work and we drop transactions. Okay. So what does all of this blockchain stuff have to do with swaps? I'm getting there, but first we're gonna talk about BTC Relay. So BTC Relay is this really cool thing made by a friend of mine, and it is an Ethereum smart contract that tracks Bitcoin headers, okay? So it works something like this. As Ethereum and Bitcoin make progress, we update the smart contract with the latest Bitcoin header over and over and over. And it always points towards the heaviest known header. Well, right. So it, as Ethereum progresses, it tracks Bitcoin's chain state and should get an SPV picture of the chain. Okay. So BTC Relay is an example of what we call a relay after BTC Relay. And it turns out that relays are expensive because you're making an Ethereum transaction every 10 minutes and that transaction is actually pretty heavy because it has to parse a whole block header and then store it. And you're storing that header forever in the Ethereum chain state and it's kind of a mess. And uh, that's why BTC Relay has been dead for a year and a half now. It died in December 2017 because nobody wanted it and nobody used it and it was terribly expensive to maintain. Okay. And we can do better than BTC Relay with blockchain. <laughs> I promise that's the last time I'm gonna use that joke. Okay, <laughs> so our SPV client and our full nodes as well are tracking the heaviest, our full nodes are tracking the heaviest valid chains, our SPV clients are tracking the heaviest chain, and so what BTC Relay lets you do is prove that a transaction is in the heaviest chain. And we do that by giving it the transaction giving it a proof that that transaction's in a header and proving that that header is sufficiently deep in the chain. So you get this ability to tell Ethereum about Bitcoin transactions. Okay. So 
BTC Relay is actually doing this very wastefully, and it's why it's so expensive. Uh, it stores everything. And if all I care about is this transaction up here at the top, uh, I, don't, I don't need any of that stuff in red at all. Like, that doesn't affect my transaction in any way. And the stuff in orange, I need about half of. And BTC Relay is tracking all of it all the time and getting a constantly updated picture. So what about we just, you know, use the parts that we need. We only need like the transaction and a few headers on top of it. That's the only part of BTC Relay that we're actually using. So this is stateless SPV. Um, and this is what we developed in-house at Suma and uh, we have deployed on mainnet today and it actually works and runs pretty well. Uh, so much like my social life, stateless SPV doesn't have a past. We're not storing anything. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't have a future, like we're not tracking any updates on top of that. We're just trying to establish one thing that happened one time in history. Uh, and again, we're making the SPV assumption that work follows valid chains, okay? So all we need to show is a bunch of work on top of our transaction. And we'll know within the bounds of our assumption that it's a valid transaction that was actually in a blockchain. Okay, so SPV has adjustable security. You can see I just added a couple headers on there. That makes it more secure, more headers, more secure. Uh, it's actually slightly more complicated than that because we don't just care about the headers, we care about their difficulty. Uh, difficulty is a measure in blockchains of how hard it is to make a header. Uh, so for example, in Bitcoin, we expect a header every 10 minutes and every two weeks, we adjust difficulty, how hard it is to make a header, so that it targets 10 minutes. If it's been taking nine minutes, we make it harder to make headers. If it's been taking 11 minutes, we lower the difficulty and make it easier to make headers. Or to find valid blocks, to put it another way. So this proof has a quality. So we have four headers with 100 difficulty and two headers with 88 difficulty, so we can easily traverse them and see the total quality is 576. We can have a shorter header with more security if the headers have more difficulty in them. So this only has five headers, but it still has more security than the previous one. The important thing here is that the value of a header changes over time. So headers 10 years ago were way easier to make than headers today. Uh, headers 10 years ago were all at difficulty one, and today we're at difficulty like a quadrillion or something. Um, so it's slightly harder to make them now. Um, so difficulty implies money spent. Uh, ASICs are really expensive, and you need a lot of ASICs to make headers with high difficulty, and that means that a lot of difficulty implies a lot of money spent. Bitcoin is adding headers at something like $250,000 an hour right now. Uh, so it's something like 40,000 ballpark to make a header in Bitcoin. In Ethereum, it's like half that. And in Vertcoin, we're adding security at about $4,000 a day, uh, which is not very fast. Okay, so difficulty means money spent. And what that means is we have an objective quality metric for these proofs. More money spent to make it means better proof, right? And the trick here is that fake proofs cost real money. If you want to fool my SPV contract, you have to actually spend hundreds of thousands of dollars building that fake proof to do so, right? And real proofs get made for you for free. Bitcoin miners will just make these things and give them to you, like it's easy. They're doing it all the time anyway. It's what they get paid for. They get paid to make these stupid SPV proofs for you. And so instead of you spending a quarter million dollars to do it, you get to spend nothing. Or just transaction fees, I guess. And fake proofs also cost real time. Bitcoin adds headers at about six per hour. If you have 10% of Bitcoin's hash rate, it's going to take you 10 hours to make six headers. And you know, on the other hand, Bitcoin miners are just making these things every 10 minutes for free. And so if I'm honest, I'm gonna get a proof within an hour, give or take. And if you're dishonest, it's gonna take you 10 hours to make that proof. Assuming you have 10% of Bitcoin's hash rate, 
which, as we said earlier, is $250,000 an hour, give or take. So honest actors are privileged in this system. They get real proofs made fast for free. Malicious actors get real proofs expensive and slow. So the trade-off here is that SPV only has economic security. We're making the SPV assumption that miners follow valid chains, and we're also making this additional economic assumption that nobody is going to spend a quarter million dollars just to mess with you. So I think that's a pretty safe assumption most of the time. Obviously, you can't make this assumption when you're transacting $10 million. Uh, that's why we have adjustable security in this protocol. Uh, if you need more security for your transactions, just require more headers. You're going to have to wait a little longer to get them, but you can get any amount of security you need. Okay. So the other thing to know is that everything only has economic security. Bitcoin only has economic security. Ethereum only has economic security. Someone with enough money and hash rate can break any of those systems. So while this is an additional security assumption, it's not the worst one in the world. Okay, so swaps, right? I thought this whole talk was about swaps. We're, we're talking about swaps now. Okay, so SPV proofs that can be verified by an Ethereum smart contract uh, are a general method of saying, of asking, did this happen in Bitcoin's history? And how confident am I that this happened? And that means we can also ask what happened. Provide me a proof of what happened with this specific event in Bitcoin's history. And uh, the EVM designers made this really big mistake where they gave me access to SHA-2, and I just went and like implemented that. Uh, it took me about a weekend at ETH Berlin. Um, <clears throat> so we have this general library for parsing and validating Bitcoin transactions and Merkle proofs and header chains and all of that stuff in Solidity. And that means we can just directly inspect the Bitcoin chain history with economic security. And that means that we can have Ethereum state that's predicated on Bitcoin's history. So we built what I like to call stateless swaps using stateless SPV. So this is the stateless swap. We have one escrow transaction where I list Ether for sale and I specify my Bitcoin sale price. We have a settlement transaction where someone pays me Bitcoin and then a settlement transaction where they get my ether. Okay, so this is where the proof comes in, is whoever pays me Bitcoin goes and submits that proof that they did so, and the smart contract gives them my ether. So stateless swaps are better than tier nolan swaps in a lot of ways. Uh, for one thing, there's only three transactions here instead of four, and uh, you don't have to be online the whole time to do it. So, the trade-off is it takes more gas. These proofs are actually fairly expensive to verify in Ethereum. It costs like 700,000 gas, which right now is a dollar something. It's not actually that bad. And another trade-off is that you can only do this with Bitcoin today. All of these other chains, they don't have SHA-2. They have like Blake2 and Scrypt and Equihash and ETHHash and all of those other weird proof of work algorithms that aren't SHA-2. So I don't actually think that's a trade-off. I'm gonna call that a benefit because it turns out nobody actually wants any of those coins anyway. <laughs> if you look at coin market cap, it sure looks an awful lot like nobody wants anything but Bitcoin and Ether. Maybe Ripple. So stateless swaps have a bunch more benefits that we're going to go over real quick. One is that there's an open market. You may notice there's no negotiation phase over there. We don't actually have to agree on this beforehand. I can just say I want to sell Ether, and I'll sell it to anyone who's willing to pay me. And uh, anyone can pay me. Uh, with tier Nolan swaps, you have to agree with a specific counterparty beforehand. With stateless swaps, you don't. You can just post a sell order. Anyone can fill it. So uh, we have no trolls and no free options, which is why there's nothing on this slide, because there's nothing to talk about. No trolls, no free options. 
they're twice as fast as tier null one swaps. So uh, the seller is done in one confirmation cycle, give or take, assuming that there is someone willing to buy. And the buyer is done in one confirmation cycle. They just have to buy with Bitcoin and then provide a proof of that later. Uh, oh, and uh, it's worth knowing that anyone can submit this proof because we did some Bitcoin transaction trickery. Okay, so they're safer. I said that we only have economic security in every protocol. Uh, I really mean that. We're actually just as reorg safe and probably safer than tier nolan swaps. And we don't allow like double purchasing on the Bitcoin side, only one buyer is accepted. Uh, like they're just safer. <laughs> and uh, we're also mainnet, we can do these today if we want to. Uh, we've been running like beta auctions since November and we're uh, upgrading the app right now. So their main net, this is what a proof looks like. Um, you can see in here, this is a Bitcoin transaction starting from this uh, general area. Let's see. Oh, there's a sequence number. There's a sequence number. Um, yes, I can actually read this and it kind of makes me sad. <clears throat> so this is, this is what a header chain looks like. Each of these 000s is a previous header hash commitment. That's why there's a bunch of zeros. Um, so in conclusion, stateless swaps are better than atomic swaps in basically every way. And uh, don't atomic swap. Any questions? So, so when this offer is placed on the Ethereum chain, uh, and let's say there's two people out, that, up out there in the world that want to take you up on the offer. How is that result? Like if they both try to initiate a swap, how does that resolve? Uh, that's a really good question. And it gets, I have a great technical post on this that you should read after this. But the summary is that uh, it turns out that blockchains were invented to solve that problem. And so what we do is we piggyback on Bitcoin's double spend protection by making it so that if there are two people willing to buy, that's a double spend. And so only one of those can go on chain. Um, why do you not have to wait a full confirmation cycle when the buyer is posting something to the Bitcoin chain? Why don't they have to wait for, it to be, for the offer to be confirmed by one full confirmation cycle of security on the Ethereum chain before they buy that? So they do except the buyer doesn't care what offer they're filling. They can just look at the Ethereum chain and see how many offers exist, what prices they're at, and how long they've been confirmed for. So the buyer coming online looks and sees open orders that are already a confirmation cycle old. Um, so you said there's no free option, but uh, so let's say the, the Ethereum person says, uh, I wanna do a one for one um, and then kind of in, in, in between them putting that out there, the price wildly changes. Uh, isn't, isn't the person who puts up the, the smart contract first like always gonna get the worst deal? Because if there's a better price elsewhere, someone won't take your contract, and if it's a bad price, they would. So it works like a good until canceled order book. So you're placing an order on the books and it's good until you specifically cancel it or someone fills it. If you try to cancel at the same time someone fills, that's a double spend and it's gonna get resolved by Bitcoin one way or the other. Um, we don't say that Coinbase Pro has free options because there are orders on the book. Um, it's an order book, not an options market. Okay, thanks. Hi, so I'm here to defend the atomic swap. Um, <laughs> So, oh boy. Um, so at Arwen, we're building systems for atomic swaps, and I want to defend the atomic swap. La all, layer two atomic swap. This is, this is actually really nice work. So, and I agree with everything you said, and if you read the Arwen white paper, the first four pages are exactly what you said. And so the way I wanted to defend the atomic swap is um, this teardown that happened here for atomic swaps. This is on blockchain atomic swaps. This is the teardown for Tier Nolan, and we are completely on the same page with you as um, that this is like 
slow, there's like griefing risk, there's a free option risk. I even use the word free option, so it's a question of like which one of us actually came up with that word first. Oh, that, that's an old thing. Yeah, like, yeah. So, so anyway, so, so the, the, my point is that I, we completely agree with you about the, the on blockchain atomic swaps, they don't really work. However, I, I think that like what's happening right now, what we're seeing in a lot of the different projects that are happening is people are finding ways to make this work, so this is like a really cool way of making it work. However, let's not call it atomic swaps. Let's call it on blockchain atomic swaps. I think that's fair, but um, layer two swaps are a completely different animal from layer one atomic swaps. You still have this really bad failure case in layer two swaps where your opponent can cause your entire channel to go to chain. Um, and so like, it's a completely different animal, and I agree that layer two swaps are way more practical than layer one swaps. But in general, like the, uh, I see Dan like moving his head around back there. Um, I, I know your opinions on this, Dan. Um, generally, uh, the whole, uh-oh, coming back downstairs. Um, <laughs> a, a bunch of these problems come from like the idea of atomicity in this in general, is that we have to delay and we have to have these fallbacks because the structure is atomic, right? Um, because of the whole like digest pre-image revelation thing. Um, and so I think that there are some really great ca use cases for layer one atomic swaps. And I think that layer two atomic swaps are going to be useful in practice. And I really like Arwin's security assumption that an exchange is a trusted counterparty, right? Trusted in the sense that they won't take actions to make themselves look bad. Right. 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 Trusted in the sense that an exchange is not going to uh, ruin your channel just to make a point or just to make a tiny amount of money. Yeah. I think that's a really great assumption that makes layer two swaps work way better. Um, so this is really nice work. I really like it. But haven't you just created a great market for miners to pick off all of the awesome open orders and leave everything else that sucks for someone else? So yeah, actually, um, this is a really good question too. Um, so as Neha notes, Bitcoin miners decide what transactions go in blocks, and that means that miners get first crack at the order book. So my contention here is that a miner front running this way has uh, neutral EV. So either the order is at market price, or it, you make a spread, right? If there's a spread, the miner can choose to take the spread by front running, or the miner can allow other market participants to tr pay a transaction fee equal to the spread. So a miner front running orders has essentially neutral or near neutral EV in an efficient market. However, that said, that's like the academic argument. I think that if miners start filling open orders, what they're doing is being market makers, and I really like market makers. Uh, so like I'm totally fine with this anyway. They're not taking money from any market participant. The seller still gets their exact sale price that they asked for. They're making the market more efficient. Unfortunately, we are out of time. So thank you so much, James. All right.